Hello, everybody. Welcome to our second webinar in this three-part series on optimizing silage storage. I'd like to just quickly introduce myself. My name is Marizan Boise. I have been with Armando Alvarez Group for almost five years now. I am the animal nutritionist of the team, so helping worldwide with all the technical silage aspects. Um, today's webinar is sponsored by the Armando Alvarez Group. We've got the agriplastics community uh, as our platform online. We are a 100% privately owned company since we began in 1964. Um, we are one of Spain's largest uh, family run companies and since then obviously have a very wide international presence exporting to over 100 countries. We have over 17 companies in the group in very diverse sectors from um, industrial packaging in um, agriculture, geosynthetics, all the way to renewable energy. Important for us is um, our circular economy. So we look at not only our growth, but as well in reducing raw materials and in uh, um, reusing waste products by recycling. Um, it's also important for us in contributing to building a more inclusive, um, fair and sustainable society. Um, today with us, we've got Arc Agriculture, we are lucky to have them with us today. Uh, they are leaders in silage storage. They provide expert advice in all things of silage design and optimizing silage storage, together with products to support that. Um, Arc is the UK expert in silage design for dairy and livestock farmers and all the way to anaerobic digestion plants. Um, they are provide unique industry leading products to help the, support their customers to produce a high quality silage and also by offering fully recyclable materials. Uh, I just like to remind everybody that we will have a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. So you can start writing down all your questions at the Q&A button, uh, Q button at the bottom. Um, so you can start now and do that throughout and then we'll try and answer as many of the questions and at the end as possible. There's also the chat function if you guys have any comments or suggestions for webinars for the future. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Will Wilson today from uh, Arc Agriculture. He is the business development director. Um, he has been with the company since 2013. Um, they have over 150 sites that use their clamps in the UK. Um, and uh, he doesn't only have experience on business management, but all, uh, as well on practical farm experience. So he truly is the, the expert to ask about all of this. And with that, I'd like to go over to you all. Thank you very much uh, for that. Great introduction and thank you to the Amanda Alvarez group for supporting this webinar um, and the agriplastics uh, community who are uh, helping to organize everything. Um, just a quick reminder that this is a second in the in our sort of uh, review of, of different silage storage topics. The first one was about silage clamps. So in this one, I'm not going to talk much about silage clamps. I'm going to talk more about the management of the silage clamp, so not so much about the design. Um, I'm also talking uh, with a sort of background in the UK, so a lot of the things I'm going to tell you will be relevant to the UK, but you might find slightly different in different parts of the world. Um, so bear with me if there's anything that you don't quite understand, you can always ask questions or, or come back to us later. Um, yeah, so what we're looking at now is basically you've built your silage clamp, you now have to fill it, empty it and manage it, and that's what this presentation is about. So. Uh, understanding where the losses come from in your silage clamp and how to avoid them. Filling the silage clamp, so what is the most effective way to fill a silage clamp to reduce wastage. Covering a silage clamp, the most effective way to cover a silage clamp, um, minimising the operator time, effort and increasing safety, ultimately with the end goal of reducing wastage. Um, emptying a silage clamp, which is something that perhaps gets forgotten at the end of the day, managing the emptying of a silage clamp is really important. And then one that's becoming more and more popular uh, and more and more important, I think, is basically the, the, the safety of working on a silage clamp. So um, what we can do day to day to improve the safety of our staff and operators working on silage clamps. Um, just to clarify, when I say silage clamp, it's basically we're referring to the concrete structure. So two walls uh, and a base. Um, other other variations of clamps might be bunkers or 
drive over piles. Um, different countries seem to refer to them as, as different things, but we're talking about silage storage um, at the end of the day. Uh, also worth pointing out the third um, the third topic going to be covered by these webinars is on the actual covering of the clamp, which will be a lot more detailed than the 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 the, the areas I'm going to cover today. So. I'm going to cover those topics and there'll be uh, future updates on covering the clamp, particularly in the next uh, webinar series. So moving on. Um, if you were present for the last uh, presentation, you'll understand this table, which is one that I keep bringing out because it's such a, an important and, and well-researched bit of information about basically where silage clamp losses occur. Um, the, the most striking thing is basically the, the dry matter losses of grass and maize inside the silage clamp so respire you know respiration within the silage clamp account for uh, up to an 18 percent loss of dry matter which is the respiration uh, and fermentation losses of 10 percent and the top spoilage and aerobic deterioration of of eight percent in grass and 10 percent in maize if you add all of those figures together plus the infield losses there's a total uh, weighted loss of dry matter of 20 percent which is enormous if you were to uh, consider your total feedstock bill, uh, divided by five. That's roughly where, in a, in a sort of badly managed or not particularly well looked after silage clamp, you might expect the losses to be to be around. Um, so if it's costing you a thousand pounds to to grow and produce your silage, you're losing twenty percent of that through inappropriate storage. There are ways of reducing that, which is why we're here. Um, it is very hard to reduce that below sort of double figures, though. So what we're trying to do is improve best practice to reduce that figure to as low as possible. So effectively, the investment you make in your silage gives you the best return. Uh, good silage means more milk or more power if you're running an AD plant. Um, so just going to move on to the next slide. So before we uh, sort of talk about how to avoid bad silage, um, apologies if this is a bit sort of simplistic but I think this is probably a good place to start is to understand what bad silage looks like. Um, I am not a uh, expert in silage uh, nutritional profiles or um, sort of much more detailed silage analysis so I'm going to do the cheeky thing and I'm going to say you need to find someone in your organization or a third party who can explain that to you in detail and talk to you about the individual sites and the individual silage quality you're producing. Um, uh, it, it's so important that the science and the technology behind it, um, it is more than perhaps you should expect to know yourself. You, you, a bit in, the, in the same way you might employ an agronomist to advise you on the use of chemicals on uh, crops, you probably ought, you ought to be employing a feedstock uh, specialist or a nutritionist who can identify the quality of your silage uh, and really give you a detailed breakdown of where your basically your nutritional profile isn't as it should be or is better or worse uh, and what you can do about it so i'm not going to tell you what what that is i'm going to leave that to a professional but the one thing i would say to you is the things that you can really understand is basically measuring um so from a very simplistic point of view if you measure what you put in and you measure what you get out there will be a difference and understanding that difference um, makes them will help you identify the weak spots and the areas you need to improve on. If you're not measuring the quality of the silage you're, you're making at the beginning or the volume of silage you're making when you're empty, filling the clamp, um, how can you possibly know what the quality and the volume of the silage is you're removing from the clamps and what the difference is? So um, weigh bridges, samples, uh, especially if you're running a big AD plant are so important. You know, you should be measuring what you're putting in, measuring what you're buying, measuring dry matters, measuring nutri nutritional profiles uh, in and out of the clamps. Um, it's not very exciting, but again, this is where it's a, a good idea to have a professional or a, uh, someone else outside of your business give you that advice. Um, the one thing I do know is that I can walk on a silage clamp um, and without any sort of specialist knowledge, I can say that is good or bad silage. And that really is based on something as simple as um, if it's smelly uh, and brown and wet or hot, it's rubbish silage and the nutritional or energy uh, properties of that silage have already gone. It's you turned it. It's already begun to break down. It has li limited value to a cow um, and almost no value to an AD plant. So uh, a real basic rule of thumb is, you know, if it looks like 
um, careful mark, it probably is careful mark, um, and that will have the same sort of nutritional profile. Um, I heard a good saying recently, which is basically, if you had to eat silage, would you eat the silage you're making now, or would you, you know, would you prefer a nicer version of silage? I know it's very simplistic, but I think there's some truth in that. If your silage is is horrible and smelly, you're not going to eat it. Um, if your silage is nice and green and 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 sort of moist but not warm, um, if it's well preserved and if it has a pleasant smell, then it, you're doing a good job. So, if it looks rubbish, it probably is rubbish. If it looks great, it probably is great. Find someone to really uh, come back to you with that information for a third party. A real expert is is my advice. So we talked about if it looks bad, it probably is bad. Um, this is my very simplistic uh, explanation of what I what, what bad silage would look like for a layman's point of view. So uh, the picture on the left with the gentleman walking up and down the silage camp, that is an example of bad silage where for some reason uh, the silage has just begun to rot. So it's exposed to oxygen. Um, this could be something as simple as uh, a, a, a join in a sheet so the two sheets the two silage sheets placed on top of the silage didn't overlap correctly um it could be that the 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 sheets weren't applied until after the clamps were filled so a long time after which has left all of that silage exposed to oxygen for too long and then a sheet was put on top but at that point it had already begun to degrade um the typical you know warning signs are as i've already mentioned large areas of black uh, sloppy, warm, and then you can also see on this example areas of mould. So those white dots are sort of mini mushrooms. The slightly bluer colours are, are, are mould spores. Um, the black areas where it's really deteriorated. Um, and then if we were to look at the um, uh, the picture in the top right, which is basically looking under a silage film, again great big area of black, uh, solidified sort of nasty. Uh, a mushy silage fortunately it probably only affects in the top area but obviously we don't want any waste at all so that's no that's no good at all um but that's what we're trying to avoid and then possibly the most interesting is the bottom right um i've already mentioned briefly that you know bad silage begins to heat up the really easy way to identify bad silage is therefore to identify where it's hot and you can see in the bottom right hand corner someone's used uh, basically a, a heat detection camera and I've identified hot spots like that little white square. If you can see in there, the temperature is much hotter than the rest of the clamp. This is basically the clamp, the silage, the silage is energy uh, being released in heat as it breaks down. Um, hot spots are, are bad news, and that's where waste is coming from. So even if you couldn't see that with the naked eye, you would be able to see that through um, basically a, 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 a heat detection camera. And then coming a bit back towards, you know, sort of asking for expert advice you can see the different um variations in spoilage uh in uh, in this profile of a silage clamp um, interpreting that information and gathering that information is really important and again better to talk to uh, an independent expert ideally who can talk you through uh, where you're going wrong and what you can do to improve your silage quality so those are typical examples of bad quality silage and that's what we're trying to avoid so there are quite a few causes of silage waste. Some of them we can avoid and we can manage, and some of them we, we really can't. They're just, unfortunately, it's, it, like everything in farming, if uh, bad weather comes along and you have to harvest your, your uh, grass or your maize, you don't have a lot of control over the quality of the silage you're going to produce. In an ideal world, you would wait till the weather becomes perfect, but we don't live in an ideal world and often we have to make decisions around uh, covering ground and filling clamps um, against the weather so uh, you know if you're bringing in silage it's excessively wet if it's raining during the process of filling a clamp um, or even excessively dry then you're going to really struggle to make good quality silage and that could be a cause of silage clamp waste um, as i've already mentioned the idea about covering a clamp is it should be done as quickly as possible because the whole principle is we're trying to eliminate oxygen or remove the oxygen from the silage. We're also trying to remove it from the silage clamp surface. If you leave your clamps uncovered for too long, you're exposing them to more oxygen, you're beginning the, the process of the silage breaking down, which is what we're trying to avoid. A slightly different one and one that we still see occasionally um, is contamination. 
Contamination becomes more of a problem uh, with grass, particularly when you talk about things like molehills and, and various, um, uh, you know, sort of field based uh, challenges. Um, so basically what, what we're trying to do is, is avoid putting uh, old silage on a new silage on top of old silage. And where it is old silage, obviously it's already beginning to break down. It will already have sort of become mature. And what you've got to be so careful of is you don't put new silage on top and, and basically contaminate new silage of old silage, especially if it's old silage that's been sat in the corner of a silage clamp for a long time. Um, uh, it becomes particularly problematic with the, the quality of your silage clamps, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute. On the contamination note, a really uh, big potential challenge is, is um, actually animals. So things like dead animals that maybe have, you know, may enter the, the, the silage clamp either, you know, once it's been made into silage or actually in the field. There have been some horrible stories in the UK of, of you know, dead animals being chopped up um, into uh, through a harvesting machinery, uh, stored it, you know, compacted into silage clamps without anyone knowing. And then basically the, the animal itself has broken down and contaminated the silage. So um, uh, contamination will cause silage plant waste. It also uh, cause nasty you know, viruses and pathogens and stuff. So uh, one to watch out for, possibly one that's easier to avoid than some of the others. Um, coming back to the contamination, the, the walls themselves. So if your silage clamp is falling over, um, it's very hard to achieve all of the sort of jigsaw of good quality silage. So it's very hard to compact silage into a silage clamp with walls that are failing. It's very hard to make a, a silage clamp that's failing um, clean and hygienic. So there's a good chance you'll be contaminating new silage of old silage. Um, so, you know, the actual storage structure itself can be a big cause of, of silage clamp waste. Um, where the, the red highlighted uh, topics are ones that I'm going to go on to talk a bit more about because they're areas that you can actually do a lot about in quite a short time period. So I won't discuss them too much at this point, other than to say um, they're really important and they are really controllable. So, um, you know, very important to look at them. Um, a bit like contamination, I suppose, vermin damage to sheets. We, we operate across the world. Um, and in the UK, not such a big problem. We get crows, you know, big birds basically come and peck holes in, in silage sheets, which obviously a hole in the sheet means that it's no longer an oxygen barrier. Um, however, in, if you go to sort of uh, places in, in Northern Europe and, and areas where there's, um, believe it or not, moose, um, they walk on silage clamps and they puncture silage clamps. Um, again, perfectly manageable, but uh, one of those things that's so frustrating if you spent all that time and money making a really, really nice silage camp, covering it really well, and then an animal comes along and makes holes in it, and it, it, you're, it's costing you a lot of money and it's causing you a lot of waste. Um, untidy feed face I'll talk about in a minute. Now, this is a really interesting one because it comes back to the storage structures, but the, the feed out rate. So not many people take this into account. And it's, to, you know, the, the challenge is obviously it's got to be cost effective to do this. But basically, you want your silage clamps to be narrow enough that the speed that you empty them should be around one and a half to two metres a week, which doesn't make a lot of sense until you think about basically the length of the clamp and the width of the clamp and the number of clamps. So the perfect silage clamp is basically two meters wide and 100 meters long and you you know your feed out rate is phenomenal so your silage is never ever uh, left exposed to oxygen for more than you know 24 hours it's, it's being constantly moved back constantly taking chunks out of a bit like uh, having a loaf of bread for example you're constantly chopping the end off the bread before it goes stale if you um it, it now that the, uh, that's a great idea, but the capital cost is enormous because you have to build a lot of silage clamps. You have a lot more walls; they're a lot narrower um, to achieve the same capacity as maybe a, a much wider clamp. So the balance is trying to improve the feed out rate so that you're constantly emptying the clamp as quickly as possible without basically designing clamps that are financially impossible to actually afford. So that's all part of kind of the service that we at Arc would offer is to decide that for you but the, the basic principles are you've got to be able to empty your silage clamp as quickly as possible uh, to avoid the silage 
face being exposed to oxygen for too long and the wider and the shorter the clamp the longer it takes to empty the silage clamp and the slower the feed out rate so the ideal clamp is narrow and long and then re-rolling in the morning uh, is another one that i think most people are aware of um but but basically once you've filled your silage clamp and you've started to compact it if you leave it for more than sort of six hours you do not then drive back on the area you finish compacting because what happens is as you compact the area that's previously being compacted, you stop uh, squeezing oxygen out and you start pumping air back in, oxygen back in. So when you start after filling the clamp and compacting it, the best thing to do is to put a lot more silage onto where you finished and start compacting the fresh silage, not rolling the old silage you, you previously put in the day before. Um, I think most people understand that, but it's just one of those little top tips for you. So I, we ran briefly over um, the different areas that you can control um, and the ones that you can't. One that you definitely can control is, is the compaction of your silage clamp. Um, lots of people have different opinions on this and several people I've spoken to, you know, genuinely believe that, and I do as well actually, that, that filling the silage clamp and compacting it's probably one of the most important jobs on your farm. Um, there's a good story of, of farmers who, uh, will only let who will, uh, who will only let themselves drive the compacting tractor because they want to be in control of the compaction process. Um, they won't let their contractors do it because the contractors might be incentivized to be quicker. So compacting, as in putting the tractor on the clamp and squashing the silage, is a really important job. And to get it right, you need to understand the rules and you need to follow them. But more importantly, and especially in the UK, you need your contractors to understand and follow them as well because your contractors, um, you know, the guys that you're paying to fill your silage clamps, their incentives aren't always to compact them as well as possible. Their incentives might be to just empty the field, to, you know, harvest the fields as quickly as possible. So there's a real balance there to get right. Um, the golden rules, which have been around for a while and, and everyone has a slightly different variation, but we're, we're fairly happy with these, is um, a minute per tonne per tractor entering the clamp. So if you've got uh, 60 tonnes of silage, so 60 tonnes of, you know, uh, it's off the Weybridge silage entering your clamp, that's one tractor. Um, that means that every, every minute that tractor is operating on there, a, a tonne of silage can be brought into the clamp. So 60 tonnes is one tractor. If you do 180 tonnes, you need to, 120 tonnes, sorry, you need to have two tractors and 180 tonnes, you probably ought to have three tractors. So. Um, it's fairly easy to work out is basically um, you work out how many tons you're bringing in per hour or per minute and then you work out how many tractors you'll need on the clamp um, that's a very simplistic way of looking at it but simple rules are sometimes the best and then to understand a bit better is uh, a third or a quarter of the weight entering the clamp per hour in machinery so going back to the the sort of uh, we were talking about say 60 tons an hour 60 tons an hour is one tractor, so that's one minute per ton per tractor. And then that tractor ought to weigh um, between, uh, you know, 15 to, to 20 tons uh, of weight. There ought to be 15 to 20 tons of weight on that tractor, on that loading shovel. That sounds like a lot, and it is a lot, um, which is why you need to think quite heavily about, you know, the actual type of machinery you're using. So you're going to put weights on the front, weights on the back, water in the wheels. Um, Again, being very simplistic, but I think it gives you a rough idea of, of where you should be heading, really. Um, we're talking about layering as well. So uh, 15 centimetres, which is really not that much, half a foot for anyone not working in metric. 15 centimetre layers, nice, even layers. And then uh, referring back to the two golden rules above that, th th that equivalent weight, basically compacting those layers. Um, it's important to get the layers right. It's a lot easier to do maize. It's a lot harder to grass. Uh, what you don't want is big lumps because the big lump will will be a lot harder to compact, to compact than, a, than a nice thin layer. And then um, obviously never re-roll, as I've mentioned. Um, one of the things that is really hard to do and is something that I think in an ideal world we would be able to manage is, is actually um, you shouldn't harvest the material or the grass or the maize faster than you can fill the clamp. Um, really hard to do. There's so many variables, distance that the material's coming from. Um, the size of the forage harvester, the size of the gangs, the size of the clamps, the availability of machinery. But in an, in an ideal world, in a perfect situation, you would be filling the clamp at the speed 
the best speed to compact everything rather than the speed of the forage harvester. There's no point in, in, in having a forage harvester that's doing bringing silage into the clamp three or four times faster than you can compact it because all you're going to do is have a lot of rubbish silage at the end and it's going to cost you the same amount of money um, and ultimately what you need to do at that point is to, is to decide that the forage harvest has to slow down um, or you have to get more tractors on the clamp or you have to redesign your sort of storage and handling. Um, so yeah, uh, clamp filling should dictate the speed and not the harvester. Uh, we're talking about um, silage covers. So as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about silage covers a lot more in the future. So I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail. But after a lot of research and, and basically the work that we've done on, on different clamp designs, we're completely convinced that, that the, the solution is, a, is an oxygen barrier silage film, which is a single layer that sits on top of a on top of your silage. And you should have a silage clamp wall. And down that wall, you should have a sidewall sheet. Again, this is a this is a plastic sheet. The sheet should fit a meter underneath your underneath your silage and a meter on top of your silage. So you create this nice blue sort of parcel um, so if your if your clamp walls are three meters high you need to be looking to buy a, a five meter high silage film which is a meter underneath and a meter on top um, it makes a big difference if you've got sloping wall clamps because it's a lot easier to manage the sidewall sheets the sidewall sheets do two things they protect the concrete panel and they also create that corner there which stops oxygen affecting the the, the top corners of, of, um, of your silage uh, basis the silage you're storing uh, I'll talk about oxygen barrier sheets a bit more in a minute. Um, the next thing is really important, and this is where countries differ massively, is basically we believe that a netting, like a secure cover netting, that goes on top of the oxygen barrier sheet, secured in place of gravel bags, is the best long-term solution for covering a silage clamp. Um, we know people use half car tyres, and that's absolutely fantastic. Um, I, the challenge in Europe is if you were to just to use a single plastic sheet and half those half car tires or lorry tires birds and animals would easily peck through that so crows for example would destroy your silage films very quickly um, we also feel that those half car tires are quite labor intensive i know that, that i know that labor might be a big challenge in lots of parts of the world but basically if you were to cover it with a net rather than a, a lots of these half tires um you'd find that you there's a potential to save quite a lot of energy and effort um, labour wise uh, and basically what the secure cover net is is it's a it's a, a, a knitted net that sits on top of the plastic sheets and is held down by the gravel bags um, and it creates a, a nice sort of profile against the oxygen barrier side of film as well holding everything in place and keeping everything tight um, gravel bags are a nightmare um, it, there are other solutions out there but they're very complicated and they require a complete redesign so these sort of automatic uh, silage film unrollers so we really genuinely think that the gravel bag, um, although I know it's, it still requires a certain element of labor, is the most flexible and, and easy to use uh, solution for, for covering a silage clamp. So we talked about, about oxygen barrier um, silage films. The, the, to give you a bit of sort of a, a basic principle of an oxygen barrier silage film, when you buy food packaging, a lot of uh, things like pita breads or uh, buns or long life breads, or even meat, um, they come in in basically a film which is very similar to a high oxygen barrier silage film. And what that is, is basically a, 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 a several layers of, of plastic that are extruded together uh, and basically resins or chemicals are used to create uh, an oxygen barrier, which, based, which, which stops oxygen, the transmission of oxygen. So a, a normal black plastic sheet will allow oxygen to pass through it. Uh, in the way that we've solved that in the past is to put multiple black plastic sheets on, so one on top of the other, and that creates a barrier because each one has a, although they have a low oxygen, a uh, high oxygen, a low oxygen, a high oxygen transmission rate, you double them up and then obviously you reduce that. What we're doing with a high oxygen barrier films is basically removing the, the oxygen, eliminating the, the transmission of oxygen, which gives you a very low oxygen transmission rate, which means there's a very small amount of oxygen will travel through the, the layer of uh, plastic um, and therefore, if it can't travel through the layer of plastic, it can't affect the silage underneath. It won't react to the silage underneath. There won't be any waste. Um, and because you're not using multiple layers of plastic, you reduce the amount of plastic you need. So high oxygen barrier films are the future. 
they will replace the need for lots of layers of plastic um, and they will produce better quality silage. Um, so once you've decided on those sheets, the, the other really important points, which perhaps don't always get thought about is design your silage covers and your silage films to fit your clamps. So get a piece of pen and a pen and piece of paper and draw a square and say, this is my clamp and decide how you want to cover that clamp. Do you want to go left to right or front to back? Uh, do you want to cover it with one massive sheet or do you want to cover it with several sheets? It depends on how many people you've got on site to help you manage that process. Um, the more accurate you can be with your seat choice, the, the sizes that you choose, the less cutting and wastage you're likely to produce. So, um, you know, just have a really simple, do a really simple uh, bit, of a, bit of a diagram and say, I need five sheets, 10 meters wide and 50 meters long uh, and get them ordered a fortnight before you need them uh, and have them on site and then explain to the people covering your clamps, this is how we're going to do it. These are the sheets, they're already here. Um, it's a very simple process and, and we're going to do it together as a group. You know, we're not just going to leave it to one or two people. Um, Silage sheets should be recyclable. I think a lot of them are, but there are still a couple out there which uh, aren't. And, you know, it, we don't live in a world where that's really uh, acceptable anymore. I think you ought to be able to recycle your silage films. Um, another point that we get asked about again and again, and again, an oxygen barrier or high oxygen barrier film can solve this problem is you should be able to walk on your silage film. So if you're buying maybe a really budget or low quality sheet, you, you might find that you walk on it and it may you make holes in it. Obviously, if you're making holes in it, then it's not an oxygen barrier and it's certainly not going to make you good quality silage. Um, and your employees or yourself are going to have a really hard time working with it because you're going to be making holes in it. You're going to be getting frustrated. You're going to be taping it. So choose one that's easy enough to walk on uh, and, and just eliminate that challenge altogether. Um, and then coming back to what I mentioned earlier is this thing about less plastic we've all got to try and use less plastic um, because A, it's expensive and, and expensive to get rid of and B, it's actually just a, a good thing to do. We we need to be looking at using plastic better and using higher quality plastics better rather than just relying on lower vol higher volumes of low quality plastics. So, I mean, all these points you can go and ask your suppliers about and, and hopefully get some feedback on. So just running through the oxygen barrier, it's something that we discussed quickly and, and my colleague will discuss on the next webinar. Um, there is some really good uh, independent research on on basically um, the use of high oxygen barrier silage films. The maths are fairly easy to do, which is basically if you if you take the value or the value of the silage you're saving and the cost benefit of the high oxygen barrier film, then they tend to pay for themselves very easily. Um, uh, and again, you get all the benefits of not throwing oil out a lot of plastic and not relying on sheets that you might puncture by walking on. So there is some good research that basically backs up what I'm saying about um, high oxygen barrier silage films. Just as, as, a, as an aside, when we talked about cover designs, this is a good example of the sort of thing we would supply to our customers. Um, here you can see basically that the clamps are uh, 25 meters, uh, no, sorry, the clamps are 29 meters wide. Um, the logical size for the, the logical size for the high oxygen barrier silage film is 35 by 10. And then we've got our secure covers netting next to that, which explains that the right sizes for the secure covers. So 32, which is two 16s by 10. So the joins all match up. And then the gravel bags, again, matching the joins, double layers around the outside. And that is a really good example of how to cover a silage clamp really easily with a good diagram um, and, and the best possible sort of solution. Um, so I'm going to rattle on a bit, but basically uh, emptying a silage clamp is the thing that everyone forgets but actually it's quite important um, you can you can have quite high losses at the emptying point of a silage clamp um, basically you've made all that effort to remove oxygen from your silage and then if you don't empty it properly you're basically you're reintroducing silage so uh, the sharp straight and vertical silage face is a must so it has to look basically clean sharp and tidy um, the, the feet, the, the face as narrow as possible. So again, this thing about narrow silage clamps make better silage. This is a really big one in the UK. It might not be across the UK, uh, across the rest of the world, but basically the height you fill a silage clamp. So in the UK, we've underinvested in silage storage and the silage clamps we have are very, very overfilled. Um, and because they're overfilled, they're very hard to empty, which means that you end up with overhangs and you end up with, with really sort of 
uneven silage faces and, and that causes waste and it's also a safety hazard it's just not a good idea you need to go away and look at your silage storage if you're having to do that um another one that pops up every now and again is basically once you've taken silage out of a silage clamp uh leaving it on the ground you know ready for the future it's already starting to break down it's already starting to remove energy this is a big problem with anaerobic digestion plants over christmas for example so if you run an AD plant and you've got a big silage clamp and you need to basically you're trying to give your guys a day off over Christmas by storing side by sort of trying to cut time out of the system by chomping silage out and leaving it next to the feed hoppers. Um, there were some staggering figures done by an AD plant that, that believed that, you know, after two or three days of silage out of the clamp left by the hopper, it's lost between 10 and 20 percent of its of its energy value. So it's two or three days. It's phenomenal. And you'll see it start to heat up and start to waste in, in you know, in hours. It can be 24 hours and you can start to really see the energy disappear. Um, removing covers is always tricky, but basically try and keep everything covered as long as you possibly can. Don't try and uncover huge areas of silage because, again, you're just letting more oxygen at it. Um, and one more for the dairy farmers, perhaps and anyone else is basically if you see areas of black wasted silage, it's important that you, you try and get rid of them as soon as you can, because all they'll do is carry on degrading and sort of uh, ultimately they could start to pollute your better silage around them. Um, and one again, this seems to be dairy farmers, sorry, dairy farmers, but basically um, the machinery used to empty a silage clamp should be looked after and cared for. So your your shear grabs, your butt rakes, uh, your buckets, all, all, all those different items you're using, your defaces, they need to be clean, um, sharpened and, and tidy and clean uh, and looked after because they're really important. So just coming back to what we were talking about there, red X's are examples of silage faces which are, are poor. You know, they're, they've slipped, the silage is rotting um they're, they're not tidy the compaction doesn't look that good um and you're wasting silage by doing that the green arrows are where they've they've really done a great job of basically a very sharp silage face very clean very well filled clamps highly compacted um and they're using a shear grab to basically keep all those areas as tight as possible so yeah if you're if you're making silage like the guys of the red arrows uh, the red crosses sorry on the left hand side probably time to have a think about it but if you can keep your silage as, as smooth and as sharp as the as the green ticks, you're doing a really, really good job. And that's where you start to get those waste figures down to sort of single digit figures. There you go. Um, this is a, a longer term one that's a bit more of a perhaps a personal uh, request <laughs> than anything else. Um, silage clamps are really unsafe. Um, there's not many ways you can make them hugely safer. They tend to be areas where you work on your own. Um, uncovering them, for example, at height. You work on them all year round. You work on them in the winter, in the summer. Um, and the risk of falling is, is high. You know, you could fall off a size camp and seriously hurt yourself. It's, it's not, it wouldn't be too hard to do. So you must do everything you can to make them as safe as possible. Um, the first thing is never overfill a silage camp. The problem with filling a clamp too high is you create a, a, a bigger fall. Um, but you also create overhangs because it's really hard to empty a very highly filled silage clamp. And you don't know where the overhang is if you're standing on top of the clamp. So a, you could be standing on top of the clamp and it could collapse underneath you. Um, I did, sorry, I missed the first point, which is basically children and silage clamps should be kept very separate. They're extremely dangerous areas. And, and I'd hate to think that, you know, children are allowed on silage clamps because, again, they, they, they have the same risks as adults, but they haven't got the same perhaps a level of uh, understanding of the risks. And another one which I've seen a few bits and pieces about is basically a nitrogen dark side, which is a, a yellow, well, it's actually colorless, but it can be a yellow and orangey gas. I believe this is caused by nitrogen in the grass that hasn't been absorbed properly. Um, and basically what it is, is it's a very toxic gas, which is created during the silage making process. It doesn't perhaps offer such a massive threat with outdoor clamps it's still extremely dangerous but when it can be really really dangerous is when it's indoors so in a shed um because obviously there's no ventilation at all it might be that you're you, you don't even notice it and you're walking around um it will bleach uh, you know plastics it will it, it might not be visible um and what the only thing you may see is like a horrible sort of orangey smoke 
Um, uh, if you see that, then the first thing to do is to identify it and, and, and let everyone know that it's happening. Um, there's not a lot of research explaining what to do next, but if it's an indoor clamp, then I'd suggest ventilating it as much as possible. And it should stop after sort of, uh, you know, two or three days to a week, in which case, you know, you, you can carry on as normal. Um, if it's in an outdoor clamp, then I think the best thing to do is just remove yourself from the environment and make sure no one goes near it until you're happy that it's sort of, it's basically dissipated. Um, another another sort of point is about staff, which I guess, you know, and uh, sorry, just to go back one, um, uncovering clamps comes back to this thing about overfilled clamps. Uh, removing the sheets is really hard to do on your own. And the, you know, the temptation is to walk close to the side of his face and pull them back. It doesn't work. It's better to stand behind the cover and pull it over the next cover on. So I overlap the covers all the way back. Um, or to use a man cage at the front. So one of these big cages that goes on the front of a loader. Um, ultimately, the best thing to do is to never do it on your own, because uh, if you can do it with two people, it's a lot less work. But also there's someone else there to uh, to look after you. And if there's an accident, you've got someone to sort you out. Um, and that again, that follows on to the new staff pace uh, point, really, which is, you know, uh, with any industry and any business, it's making sure that your staff are, understand how it works and, and basically the risks of working on a silage clamp uh, and, and look after them as well. Because it, you, uh, in the UK, perhaps we've been a bit a bit sort of relaxed about basically giving people jobs and not expecting them to know what to do. And then when they have had accidents, um, being sort of surprised but we shouldn't be you should the training and the, and the risk assessments are very important on silage clamps and then the last one which is a really good practical tip is when you're taking silage clamps samples so samples from the silage face um it might be a lot better or a lot safer to use the bucket of the of the loader drive it in drive in the corner so the edge of the bucket into the areas of the silage face you want to sample scoop out little chunks reverse the, the loader away from the silage face and then take the sample from the loader. That seems to be a much safer way of doing it. Otherwise you have to walk up to the silage face and do it by hand. And the risk of doing that is it collapses on you, um, especially with the bigger biogas plants. Uh, that is quite a significant risk really. And um, you know, how a, a silage camp avalanche is a, bit, is a big problem uh, that we haven't had yet, but I don't think it's a long way off. Um, so I've talked long enough <laughs> about silage camp management. I will stop there um, and I will be delighted to answer any of your questions. Um, and thank you very much for, for listening to me for so long. Thank you, Will. That was uh, very interesting. Like you say, with the, especially with the safety, uh, I have fallen on a bunker numerous times. Uh, oh. you, <laughs> you tend to <laughs> underestimate the bunker and silage, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, just uh, uh, before we get to the Q and A, um, I just like to to point out a, a few of the questions. If we can have a di quick discussion on that, um, I find a lot of people, especially when you look at the losses of the silage, they also tell you they're making a good quality silage because they only measure what goes in and what goes out. So they only look at that eight to ten percent. A lot of people don't take into consideration the 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 nutritional losses that you don't see is is that also typically what you find it, yeah it's really interesting what you're saying about measuring go, what goes in and what goes out i think some people aren't even measuring that much so <laughs> some people don't even know what they're putting in so um so i'm sort of when i give that advice i think what i'm trying to explain is that there you need to start somewhere so if you're not even doing that yet it's really hard to then take it to the next level and talk to an expert like yourself to understand the nutritional losses. So you'd be amazed how many farmers, when you ask them how many tons of silage they've got in their silage camps, have no idea because okay. they, they haven't been weighing trailers or okay. they might not even know how many trailers. They might say, oh, it's 10, 10 hectares or 20 acres or whatever, but they really don't know what, what the sort of, what the actual tonnage that they've, they've basically harvested is. So I completely agree. It's, it's, it's a very complicated topic, but we're not even doing some of the basics right at the moment <laughs> so, yeah <laughs> it's got to start somewhere yeah yeah no perfect no it's 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 truly it's amazing sometimes because yeah. it's it's interesting like you say um a lot of people forget 
that they are technical people that you can ask. And a lot of companies um, with products that they're selling is this is additional service that they provide. So they come on farm, they look at your compaction and your dry matter, your chop length and all of that. And I find a lot of people don't take advantage of that. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure you, you experience the same. Uh, absolutely that's why that's why I don't try and offer that advice because it's it's such an expert level of of understanding that that mm -hmm. I tend to stick to the more simple stuff and and point people to the experts for that for that information mm -hmm. and yeah. you know it, it is a it is an expert knowledge and um you, like you say there are lots of people out there who okay they might try and tell you something during the process but ultimately they'll tell you quite a lot of information about your silage for free so mm -hmm. what you haven't got much to lose on that point of view no, definitely, definitely. Um, and then especially like what you say on the contractors, because that's a, a big problem that we've got here. Uh, usually the contractors are in quite a bit of a hurry to, you know, they obviously have to get to the next next job or on the next farm. Mm -hmm. So they tend to, if especially if they are controlling the whole process, um, it is difficult because they the first thing is usually is on the compacting. That's the one thing that they'll start to basically neglect mm -hmm. in order to 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 save up time um i don't know how much contracting uh you guys use there but um maybe it's, you can um, elaborate a bit so that's it's totally totally the case and if you look at the picture in the background of this this big these big sets of clamps mm -hmm. this is a this is a biogas plant an anaerobic digestion plant mm -hmm. and before ad came along no one really understood the sort of the sort of partnerships with contractors but mm -hmm. biogas because the volume and the value of the silage they're making and now entering into sort of more complicated contracts, which basically um, will pay contractors to do a certain amount of, you know, basically the harvesting, but there'll be bonuses for silage quality at the end. So they're That's trying to basically get the contractor to, to take some responsibility for the total silage quality. Um, and that seems to be, that's hard to do because there's so many mm -hmm. variables, mm -hmm. but that is one thing to really consider is to, is to basically say to a silage contractor, I don't just want it filled as quickly as possible. I want the best possible silage quality at the end. Um, and I think by doing that, you can create longer term relationships. And as long as you agree what the measurements are, it could be that at the end of the year, you know, once the silage camp has been emptied or once they've done analysis of the silage after it's been filled and covered for a couple of months, you have some sort of uplift agreement or some sort of bonus that you pay the contractor um you know for basically for making good silage um i'm not sure how well that would work in dairy and livestock but it, it's increasingly popular in in um anaerobic digestion and biogas so no, it's, it's, one it's very interesting yeah yeah it's, it's a good concept yes um and then the the last thing is like what you say especially i i know we don't want to go into details uh because it's going to be in the next webinar uh but especially on the plastics while you mentioned it on looking at your oxygen transmission rate and looking at your spec sheets of the plastics that you are using um and it, like you say a lot of people aren't using gravel bags at this stage but it just it just works so much better in order to conform basically to your um to your bunker better than what tires do i mean tires are laying flat while gra gravel bag follows the contours a lot better mm. um and especially the sidewall sheeting i've i've seen a concrete walls that look horrific after yeah. four years just because yeah. of the acid that has broken away on so for me uh, i find the silage walls um the the sheeting on the silage walls especially um you know, it, 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 important just in that aspect, not on anything else, just in that aspect, it's important. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's this thing about just, it's all part of the jigsaw, but it's it's one of the things you can really control. So mm -hmm. you can't control the weather and you can't control your contractors as much as perhaps you want to, but you absolutely can decide to buy the right sort of silage films. Um, and, you know, that that is that can make a big difference. So you know, control what you can control and then try and control what you can't control, <laughs> I think would be my... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I think let's go to the Q&As. Um, the first question, have you seen other compacting machinery used on silage clamps like the chain wheel presses and what do you think of them? Uh, yeah, so the answer is we see all sorts of crazy things. Uh, road rollers, um, you can't see it, but if you looked where it says Q and A on this slide, if you look behind the and, that's actually a tractor with a train wheel press on it. Um, 
people have mixed opinions about them. I mean, at the very the very simplest level, they add a lot of weight, which is a good thing because it's com increasing compaction. Um, and I think they're all they're all good additions uh, to to basically help compaction. But it's got to be part of the whole the whole sort of the whole the whole message. You know, it's, it isn't you you will you won't make good silage with just by buying train wheel compactors. You have to get everything right. Um, the one thing I'd be really cautious about recommending to people is is uh, is to understand the the design of your silage clamp walls. So if your silage clamps are 50 or 40 years old, they will not be strong enough for a great big tractor with a train wheel on the back or a road roll or any of those things. So what you might be doing is you might be um, uh, adding more weight, which is great, and adding more compaction, which is great, but you might also be destroying your silage clamp. So it, 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 as much as I think they're fantastic, I think they have to be, it's all relevant to what your what your sort of facilities are. And actually, if you want those silage clamps to last another 10 years, by adding this much weight, you might be shortening their lifespan. It might be a bit of a false economy and you might be better off with more lighter tractors rather than one great big heavy tractor. Um, but yeah, we've seen all sorts of cool things on the clamps. It's quite fun. Yeah, I've, I've seen as well huge machines that uh, that are crazy. You know, they just don't can't handle the weight. It's it's crazy. Yeah. Um, just our second question: um, How can I ensure my contractors filling the clamps are doing a good job? Um, maybe that comes back to that that little sort of uh, sentence about basically you know giving them some sort of incentive to do a good job. Um, the other thing is to to agree with them at the beginning. So before they start, you say to them. Uh, I'm employing you or, or I want your services on this basis. And maybe you say to them, you give them the golden rules and you say, I want two two clamps, two tractors on this clamp. I want one forage harvester. I want three trailers and I want you to fill it at this pace. And, um, you know, and and if I have to pay a bit more for that service, then I'm willing to do that. Or, um, you know, I guess if you have that discussion early on, then they'll accommodate that or, or, or you just have to trust them um, and, and you have to monitor them. And it's a tricky discussion because obviously there'll be high priority and low priority customers. There'll be ones they've worked with forever and ones that are new. I guess if your silage clamps are rubbish and they're falling over and they're dangerous, then you're going to be very low priority for a contractor because he doesn't want to come on your silage clamp and burst his tires and, you know, his tractor fall off. So you know make your contractor's life as easy as possible agree with them as early as possible as, as to your expectations and then you know maybe be prepared to pay for it so you know explain mm -hmm. why you want what you want and and you know be ready to pay a bit more to have it done that way i think mm -hmm. probably an option yeah perfect i think i also find most of the time people are just let monitor your contractor go to yeah. the site often and check what that they're doing i mean it doesn't help you try and intervene at the end uh you have to do it from the beginning yeah absolutely and like i say if you've agreed at the beginning what they're meant to be doing then they know what they're meant to be doing if you haven't agreed at the beginning what you're meant to be doing they can do whatever because there's no there's no goalposts yeah. you know mm -hmm. <laughs> Another question, uh, will you cover technical re requirements of the polyethylene silage cover web? Uh, what kind of opportunities do you see incumbent uh, polyethylene structures that need to be improved? Uh, what are the key priorities in that regard? So basically talking about, about the sheets or the nets, I, I, uh, let me just see if I can find that question. You said polyethylene silage cover web. Um, uh, okay, so I'm I'm going to assume it's like the netting, the yeah. the, the, the netting because that's polyethylene. Um, there are lots of things we can do to to basically improve our the netting and the, to be honest, any any of the plastics we use. The priorities for the improvement of the plastics we're using at the moment are they've got to do the job, they've got to be oxygen barriers, they've got to be usable, um, and they've got to be handleable, which is another thing that I think we're starting to realise, which is the rolls themselves. You know, the weight of the rolls, it's got to be easy enough to use on a silage clamp and they've got to suit the individual customers. Um, they've got to be cost effective. And then I think that the most important thing is they've got to be recyclable. So we're always going to be pushing towards improving those factors, you know, making them easier to use, making them better oxygen barriers, making them easier to recycle. Um, from the netting point of view uh, and, and from the covers as well. The biggest factor we really want to get across to people is perhaps the education about about using them as well. So, 
it's not just changing the products, it's changing the customer's attitude and their understanding of how they're used best. So um, if it's a technical, I'm more than happy to answer a technical question properly um, at a later date, but we're always trying to push to, towards those goals and we can achieve them through education and through product development. I think that's where we're at at the moment. Okay, perfect. Um, from your perspective, what are the pros and cons of a, cl a clamp type of silage design versus silage bags versus traditional metal silos? So uh, just to clarify, a silage bag would be what we call an UK and ag bag, which is a long, a long silage sausage. Correct. A silage clamp would be uh, just in my head is what we're looking at in the background here. So two concrete walls. And then I think that when you say a steel silo, is that like an American I think that's like the American design of basically a tower silo, isn't it? Yes, um, perfect. So interestingly, in the UK, I don't think there are any operational tower silos left. And I think there are maybe only a dozen to, to 30 or 40 that ever operated in the UK. So I can't comment much on tower silos, though. I understand from a usability point of view, they're quite good at making good silage and they're automatic, aren't they? So the idea is I think you press the button and it, it automatically removes the silage. Um, so I can see massive benefit to, from that to, from a labour point of view, um, but I don't know enough about them to comment much further than that. The, the silage clamp, like the one in the background, um, the big advantage is basically the, the volume of silage you can store in those in those bunkers. The walls retain the base of the silage, so you get a nice, a nice tight wedge, which increases compaction. But you can store uh, hundreds of thousands of tonnes in, in a design like that, which is basically a, a floor on some walls. Um, you can feed them out much easier. They don't take up nearly as much space. They don't use as much plastic um, as say the, the ag bags or the, or the, the big plastic tubes. Mm -hmm. So the disadvantage to a clamp is once you built it, it's really hard to, you know, you can build more, but they're not as flexible. So the great thing about like a long silage tube, these sort of ag bags or, or whatever you want to call them is if you, if you have a much bigger yield, you just make more of them. You know, you just the machine just lasts, stays on the farm longer and makes longer bags. Whereas with a silage clamp, if your yield is much bigger than you're expecting, all you can do is fill it higher until it gets too full, and then it, it you know it becomes a hazard. So mm. flexibility is is probably the, the biggest advantage of the silage bags. Um, cost effectiveness and plastic uses is the biggest advantage of like a silage clamp. And then I, I, the steel the steel silos, uh, I, I I imagine it's a it's a labour thing um, that possibly makes them more effective. But I'll be interested if anyone has any feedback to you know to drop me an email. Yeah, like you say, I've I also haven't really seen the metal silos. It's not it's quite expensive, so I don't think you you generally new systems. That I don't think they're putting putting that in a lot. Uh, but we have covered this quite quite extensively in previous podcasts and webinars. Um, so you guys are more than welcome to go look at that. Uh, yeah. We we go into the advantages of disadvantages of the different systems. Um, then what should I do uh, with the waste silage on my clamp? Um, the answer, uh, that's a good question, actually. Um, so I guess it depends on your attitude. So uh, AD plants, for example, the biogas plant, there is an argument that you could put it into your biogas plant because at the end of the day, it, it will be destroyed within the biogas plant. But that's a pretty poor argument because you're adding bad, it's still bad silage. So there's no energy in it anyway, and it's full of bad bacteria, and you're putting it into the, your AD plant. So the only reason you do that is to dispose of it. Um, and I don't think that's, I think that's a false economy. I guess most people with, with bad silages, they'd write it off as a loss um, if it's really bad, and you basically put it, you treat it as muck uh, and put it into your muck heap or, or you, you know, and uh, let it rock down and, and spread it as, as if it was uh, animal waste, I suppose. Um, mm -hmm. I would be really cautious about doing anything else. Um, I know some people like feed certain certain like lower grade cattle might eat it and stuff, but it all feels like a false economy to me, you know. No. Yeah. yeah, never do that, please. <laughs> it's amazing what you see on farms. <laughs> yeah, no, I knew now a lot would mix those top silage losses. Yeah. They mix with all the silage and say, but it basically dilutes it, if I can put it that way. Yeah. Uh, but there's a lot of studies that as will show what happens when you do feed it to animals and it's um 
it's 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 really bad just don't do that <laughs> it will be exactly the same in a biogas plant then exactly the same principle is you're, exactly. you're contaminating the stomach <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, yeah. same principle yeah and then what are the typical life uh, lifetime ranges that you could have for clams regarding different regions and crops uh so what is that like the length the, the, the lifespan of a silage clamp do we think correct yes um, so in the UK, a uh, silage clamp has to has to last twenty years with maintenance. So uh, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't be uh, sorry. I'm just going to put this next slide. I wouldn't be too too shocked if uh, if a silage you know a twenty year lifespan for a silage clamp feels pretty good. It depends how you use it and how you look after it. Um, uh, you know if you if you're if you maintain it, there's no reason it shouldn't last for a lot longer. If you don't maintain it and you ignore it and you overfill it and you drive into it with diggers and and you abuse it, then it could last a lot shorter. It just depends on the type of clamp you've built, the environment you built it in, and the way you've managed it. So, um, I think you know, twenty years is, is should be a reasonable lifespan. But lots of lot, lots can change in that time. You may you know, but lots of people in twenty years' time will want more silage clamps because they're expanding, for example. So, um, yeah, twenty years shouldn't be shouldn't be out of reach of, of most silage clamps designs okay uh secure covers are great where the winters are mild we have snow and ice in ontario and so the covers are sometimes impossible to remove any ideas on a new product that serves the same purpose we get asked this loads <laughs> so we uh, we only used to work in the uk and it was very easy because in the uk all we had to worry about was you know birds and crows and bits and pieces but now we suddenly realised there's this whole world around us of, um, of basically, you know, people with different challenges. Um, the answer is there's a lot of secure covers sold in places like um, Norway and Sweden, and we're trying to understand a bit more about how they use them to because of the snow problem. One of the things that we perhaps uh, think might help is actually using narrower secure covers. So rather than trying to move a large area of netting, you use you move a smaller area of netting. So you're not carrying that huge amount of snow and ice off every time you do it. Um, uh, there are different ways you can do it with things like straps. Um, um, to be honest, that it might be one of those things where I haven't done enough research yet to understand that, but I will write a blog post or we'll have a think about it. Um, or if we have anyone, on, anyone else who's joined in who has a theory on, on how to do it, that'd be really helpful. Um, because we know that they do work in snowy and icy, regions but obviously there's a way of doing it that makes them easier <laughs> easier to do okay perfect um and last question how are the plastic covers being recycled right now in the uk is it circular so at the moment in the uk uh we were originally part of the ape plastic scheme which i think has might have changed it you see i'm not sure yet how we fit into that with regards to our membership of the european union etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but at the moment, what's happening is, is there are networks of, of farm plastic recyclers who are doing, you know, chemical bottles and, and all sorts of bits and pieces. And this is just another product that they'll be collecting. Um, they'll be collecting large volumes of plastics from farms uh, and then basically they enter the recycling chain. When, when people say circular, do, you, do they mean, do we, are, they, are they coming back into are the raw materials going back? Basically into recycled, the, yes. Yeah. Is it so recycled? I, yeah, they are being recycled, and my understanding is that they that they take all of the farm waste or plastics, and then they recycle them down to pellets, and those pellets go back into into other products. Which uh, there's a great company called Solway. So if you ever want to look into it in more detail, Solway uh, are, are a company based in Scotland who who specialise in recycling farm plastics and making them into completely new products. So the answer is um, yes, they are being recycled. Where they end up, I'm sure varies wildly depending on what, who wants the, the the sort of raw materials at the end um so yeah the answer is yeah um i think that's everything so will thank you so much for your time and your knowledge i hope it was very informative for everybody uh you can contact will or myself or uh, directly on the agri plastics community with any other questions that you may have um and then with that i just want to say thank you to everybody for joining us um 
in the second second one that we had, second webinar that we had, um, please join us again in July for our third one. Um, and then uh, it, the link of this will be sent to all the participants um, after the webinar. Um, and then it would be loaded on the Agriplastics Community YouTube channel as well. Um, and then as well, there's just going to be a survey if you guys could please help us and fill that out just for us for the future to know uh, to get, get, supply informative content for you again. Uh, so yeah, Will, thank you so much again for all your time. Yeah, and if anyone wants to um, drop us an email, please just just go ahead. Um, we'd be delighted to help out. And like I say, if I if I if you disagree with anything I've said, or if I if I've misspoken, then then again, drop me an email and put me right. <laughs> because, uh, I only know what I know. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, everybody. Thank bye. you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye.